Hi, this is TapCat, and today we're going to talk about five things I wish I knew about XCOM 2 before I started playing. But before we start, I'd like to welcome Saiken, who you may recognize from his channel, Saiken for Games, so he can share his views on this subject. Thank you for having me, TapCat. Yeah, of course. I'm really happy you were able to join me. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with Saiken's channel, he covers a lot of strategy games. And more specifically, has gone as deep into XCOM 2 as anyone that I know of. He's done all kinds of insanely difficult challenge runs, rescued viewer campaigns that were on the verge of failure, and just generally plays at a level that most of us can only dream of. So anyway, I can't recommend his channel enough, and I definitely encourage you to check it out. With all that said, let's go ahead and kick off the list. Starting at number five on my list of things I wish I knew about XCOM 2 before playing is to understand what we're getting into. If there's one thing that I've learned from the comments section of my guides video, it's that there are a lot of people who try XCOM 2, struggle with it, and then quit while blaming the game for whatever went wrong, and then they'll label it as broken and unfair. You can call it, uh, Dark Souls Syndrome, if you like. Now, it feels more than a little weird to me that I need to say this about a franchise that already has a reputation for being difficult, but new players really need to make peace with the fact that XCOM 2 is going to challenge you in multiple ways. You may solve some of those challenges easily, and there may be others that you really struggle with, but I promise you that they can all be solved. You can win. You can win consistently. You can even win consistently at the highest level of difficulty. But to do that, you have to commit to figuring out how to overcome obstacles rather than let them get the best of you or just simply making the decree that they're impossible. Now, I'll give you one example. We all know that it's painful to miss shots. And a lot of people love to complain about the RNG. Yes, your chance to hit is one of those challenges. But the game gives you many ways to address it. Take to the rooftops every chance you get. Use your grenades to break enemy cover so you'll get a flanking bonus. Equip scopes. Use the perception PCS. Use hollow targeting on your grenadiers. Give a ranger blade master so you can push through guaranteed damage even when you're low level. Seriously, just leveling up helps a lot. But the point is, when there's something in the game that's a real pain point for you, then don't just accept that as a given. Bring the mindset that you're going to look for solutions, that you're going to find the solution come hell or high water. Believe me, having the right mindset will go a long way toward helping you get over the hump with this game. All right, that's my two cents anyway. And that is very interesting, Tapcat. Um, maybe two ideas. You actually brought up, you snuck two points in into one there. <laughs> one um, essentially was the inability or the flaw of XCOM to maybe not explain where the difficulty is coming from. One of the things that I noticed in the communication with my channel most often was that people simply did not know what they were doing wrong. So uh, there is not a really good feedback mechanism in the game. You're continuing to die over and over. And typically, a player tries to then just do it over and over and over. And at the end, they are blaming the RNG and the lack of luck, when in reality, Typically, if you're failing at the game, it's uh, rather a problem of your macro or micro strategy. And the second aspect that you uh, brought up was just leveling up and, and finding specific uh, solutions for typical problems. And that, again, requires a little bit of pre-knowledge. So uh, I would fully agree with what you're saying and add to that, you might want to go onto the XCOM2 uh, wiki and actually like work around that flaw of XCOM in order to read a little bit through um, what each of the enemies are doing or even look at a uh, let's play of a more experienced player because uh, within a few 
minutes would be too little, but within a few hours, you would potentially increase your gameplay quite drastically if you're not just accepting that the game, um, what the game presents you, but finding ways to kind of overcome it. So I not only agree with you, you're kind of spoiling a later point <laughs> with a lot of what you said. <laughs> so I won't actually go any deeper than okay. that um, for the moment. But I will say you also, it's sort of a perfect segue to my uh, fourth item, which is ignore virtually everything that Bradford or the game tells you to prioritize. Uh, like he'll tell you to just run face first into ambushes when you're on retaliation missions. You know, he's always trying to just make you run forward full speed, which is a horrible plan. Or you need to build a workshop at the very beginning of the game and do, you know, do the skull jack now, now, now when the reality is there's other things that are much more urgent to do. The game not only doesn't always make it clear what you should be doing, when it gives you guidance, I feel like a lot of the time, it's just straight up wrong and counterproductive. I don't know if the developers were literally trying to troll players with this stuff, <laughs> Or if it was just that at that phase when they were developing it, they didn't really even understand the game well enough to give you good advice. But what I would say to new players especially is don't fall for this stuff. Ignoring Bradford is pretty much always the right move. <laughs> that, is, uh, that is so true. My take on uh, that, Ted Kett, would be I think I think they originally included Bradford as a means to create tension. But after the fourth mm -hmm. or fifth times that you heard him, Commander, the aliens are making progress. If uh, we don't act now, we, uh, we can't slow them down. Like if you hear that phrase over and over, not only does it create PTSD, but it also uh, <laughs> does not really achieve anything because typically, one of my favorite stories is always in the terror missions, right? You you are in the middle of a firefight, uh, laser beams are shooting left and right, a berserker just runs to your face, and Bradford explains uh, to you that you're doing a really, really poor job because civilians are dying. <laughs> <laughs> like, I do understand the element of tension in there, but it, it feels at the same time so much rubbing it in your face, um, and sometimes you just <laughs> yeah. really can't do anything thing about it because um, because you were not in control the the classical i don't know purifier runs into uh in in a haven uh, defense mission purifier runs into the uh, central room with all of uh, the uh, um, civilians in there uh, then your resistance order shoots the purifier purifier explodes six people die great so uh, we, we all had those x core moments but bradford just is over the top there I, I I would agree. Just ignore him. Yeah. He really is. And I agree. I've had that same thought. I genuinely believe that his dialogue, particularly during missions, it's there to make you be more tense and to wind you up and create a sense of urgency and stuff. And I can understand that, but it still gets under my skin. I'm not going to yeah. lie. All right. Um, so number three, this is kind of an interesting one. You know, in, in kind of the culture of XCOM 2's player base, there's a real thing about what people will call save scumming. And when you're talking about something as simple as, I missed a shot, so I'm going to reload and see if I can hit. I agree. That's not productive. It's just kind of a silly thing to do. But my point is, don't be ashamed to reload a mission so that you can replay it with a different approach because you can learn a lot that way. You can really accelerate the learning process. If you save when you first get to a map before you do anything and then, you know, play through the mission like you normally would, you know, let's say, um, Usually you're trying to get to some spot on the map and maybe you reach a point where you're still concealed and there are a couple of enemy pods 
And the question is, do I try to go around them or do I just engage them now? Well, why not go ahead and try it one way and play the mission to conclusion, see if you win. But whether you win or not, wouldn't it be nice to know which approach ended up being better or worse? Why not reload it and try the other path that you thought of? And there's just a lot of things like that where I feel like you can encounter a situation where there's at least two things that seem like they might be good ideas, especially when you're new to the game and you haven't had a chance to really see what works best for you yet. I would just say you're going to, to get a good handle on what tactics work best for you if you try applying them on the same map with the same mission because you eliminate a lot of kind of noise and variability that way. So I don't know, maybe to some people that'll be controversial and they'll just lump it in with save scumming, but it's not about changing the outcome. Like you can, if you want to, you can make the pact with yourself that you'll always keep your first pass as the save you move forward with. It's not about that. It's just literally using it as an opportunity to learn more and learn faster. Mm -hmm. I like your approach to that, Tepkit, I must uh, say. So maybe for starters, I think anyone who seriously discuss it, uh, discusses whether or not safe scumming is bad, that, that's a very elitist approach to the game. And I would, I would not say that in a single player game that there is even room for it. If you want to safe scum, uh, knock yourself out. Uh, but the, the question I'm, that I'm always asking myself when safe scumming, and I think you had a really good answer to that, is typically what I see in, let's say, eight or nine out of 10 cases is that people are safe scumming in order to just uh, mm, switch the RNG a little bit or approach a firefight a tiny bit different and get that little edge. And I would say that will not really help you in the long run. Um, th there is no point in going up in the difficulty and then just trying to save scum your way through legendary. Um, the, you might as well save a lot more time for yourself to lower the difficulty a little bit and just play through it. Um, in a with larger iterations of uh, of saves, maybe an honest man or something like that. People always ask, "How can I improve the fastest?" And I like your approach, which is uh, looking at missions in more than one way. Another way of of just improving faster is learning out of the mistakes and actually after every mission, thinking about okay. I'm being self-critical what went well and what could have gone better. And I think your way of kind of replaying a key moment in a mission is a fantastic way of finding that out and kind of debugging is a strategy that I've uh, taken as a given, really working that well, or should I approach it from a different direction? So I would say if you if you are about learning, safe scumming um, in, in a way of approaching it with very different strategies, great. If you just do it to win a firefight, you're potentially missing the target and actually robbing yourself of valuable time to learn. Yeah, I agree. I also think um, the kind of classic save scumming, I don't even really like that term, to be honest. I'm with you. I, I'm not really big on telling people how they should play their single player games. Uh, the, you don't need my approval. But where I think it's a little self-defeating is even though it sucks, like if you do your genuine best and you lose a couple soldiers or you lose the mission, it sucks. Like, yeah, it's not fun. But that's also, that's part of how we learn is dealing with the consequences. So when you, when you uh, reload a save just to take a single shot over again or something and you remove the consequences of your choices, it can actually make it harder. Like, if you ever do knuckle down and stop doing that, um, you're not going to be as well prepared to deal with the consequences of your actions. And like, what happens in a campaign when you lose? Uh, like, I remember one campaign that I played for the channel, and I had this horrible run of losing specialists in particular. Nobody else, <laughs> but it was like my specialists were the literal Star Trek red shirts of the campaign. <laughs> 
I had to deal with it, you know? So anyway, um, I, I would, but I will say judicious use of saves. Yeah, it can be really <laughs> useful. All right. Um, number two. So this one, I would say, um, when you start a turn, try to think of the one or two things that you absolutely positively must accomplish before that turn ends. So like it could be, let's say you're on the last turn of a timed mission and you have to, you know, hack their computer or whatever it is. And it's difficult. Like, it's hard to see how you're going to get there. Everything else, set it aside for the moment and see if you can find any way that it's possible to make that happen. If you're confronted by, you know, m way more enemies than you know you can kill in a single turn, then ask yourself, you know, who is the threat on the board that will absolutely wreck me if I leave them alive to do it? Whatever it is, every turn could be different. Um, listen, sometimes at the beginning of a mission, it may just be moving as far forward as possible. But ask yourself that question and then devote yourself to finding the way to get that done. Don't even accept the possibility that you can't because it's almost always going to be a challenge so in a way, I guess this is almost like what I talked about in um, point number five. It's having that mindset of first identifying what's the challenge I need to solve this turn. And then you just refuse to accept any other outcome. I will find a way to make that happen. So it's pretty simple in concept, but I personally have found that amazingly powerful in practice. That's really an interesting approach. And I would agree specifically on that last turn. I will say though, maybe as a nuanced um, approach to it, the way that I'm looking at finishing a mission is, I am uh, very well aware what that mission would uh, bring you. Say you're, you're on a mission for a scientist. And if you really have just that one turn to hack the enemy relay or to destroy it, um, then one thing that you can do is you can actually think if I'm focusing all of my energy to uh, to successfully finish that uh, part of the mission, how many retaliation um, uh, will I realistically take? I.e., am I going to <laughs> am I going to lose a soldier or not? And here's the kicker: if you find yourself uh, surrounded and you're potentially losing one or two uh, soldiers that might even be leveled, in some cases. It is just wiser to accept that uh, you're evacuing and that you're uh, losing the mission instead of losing uh, the soldier. So the one thing that I would uh, say is be aware that there are two win conditions. There's a theoric victory and an, and an actual victory. The theoric victory is, for instance, if you destroy the relay, but then evac and can't kill all of the aliens. In that case, typically what happens in XCOM 2 is it allows you to counter a dark event or whatever the kind of side condition of the mission was. And sometimes that's good enough to just justify focusing on destroying the relay and then evacuing. Um, if you can't do either, uh, and you're going to lose the mission uh, unless you're getting yourself into a lot of danger, I would just do a calculation. Am I willing to lose one or two units for, say, a scientist or whatever the reward of uh, of the mission is at the end of the day. That's the only thing that I would uh, add to it because sometimes uh, it's better to uh, live and fight another day than to sacrifice your entire team. I actually agree with that 100%. And I, th I guess what I would say is that's part of what goes into the calculation of what you have to accomplish that turn. Keeping your soldiers alive is kind of always a big priority for me. The you know, I think the only exception I make to that, it's not even really an exception, but sometimes I guess it's just bowing to the reality of the situation. There are times where I feel like um, the situation is so dire that there's a real chance someone is going to die, right? 
Right. If yeah. I have a rookie or a squatty on the team <laughs> and the rest are high level soldiers that I've invested a lot of time in, I will go out of my way to make the rookie a more tempting target. Take um, one for the team, mate. But no, I, yeah, I mean, listen, not to be cold hearted about it, but if I have like my Colonel Ranger out there <laughs> and a rookie, um, I'm sorry, buddy, but yeah, <laughs> step right up. Um, so, but I agree. No, I, I'm not generally one to say soldiers are dispendable, uh, expendable, excuse me. And, um, I do think you have to put that in. And like, I guess I would even say part of it is, Let's use the hacking as an example and where you have to move your specialist to will clearly expose mm -hmm. them, right? So now the second phase of that is, do I have a mimic beacon? Do I have something that I can do where I can either kill virtually all of the enemies so they won't take any damage or redirect their fire? You know, you, there are resources, there are tools in the game. Now, if there's three pods active, you don't have any mimic beacons, you don't have anything going on. Yeah, then I wouldn't say, well, just move your specialist <laughs> out there and hope for the best. <laughs> Trust me, it'll all work out. This is XCOM. When does anything bad ever happen? Yeah, that's true. Hi, Future Tapcat here. And I just wanted to backtrack a little bit on the conversation regarding setting goals for each turn. Saiken raised some really reasonable points, and then we had a bit of a discussion about it. And I realized, though, that in just accepting the premise of essentially like, well, what if you can't accomplish your goal without losing somebody? I let my point get watered down because really that's all just part of the process that I'm talking about. So, for example, uh, Ray is going to come and help me make this point. Uh, for example, let's say you do seem to be badly outnumbered. I would just say, um, even using the same exact example that we were talking about, so if your specialist needs to move forward out of cover in order to make the hack, the first part of your plan needs to be, how do I thin their numbers enough or, you know, take them out entirely before doing that, or thin them out in conjunction with using things like frost bombs, mimic beacons, etc., so that you can still move forward safely. And it's very easy to look at a difficult situation and in advance of you doing anything to say, oh, I, I can't, I, I, I can't accomplish what I want to. But that's kind of the whole point of what I'm talking about is that once you start breaking down what you need to accomplish into component parts, prioritize what should be done first and then start executing. Obviously, if there's something as dangerous as moving a character out of cover, you would save that for last and make sure you genuinely can do it without all but a guaranteed loss. But, you know, don't just look at the situation in advance and throw up your hands because you could do that on almost every turn where there's an active enemy. So I just wanted to kind of refocus my point because I do think that in having what was a good and very reasonable discussion, I kind of let that slip away. And with that, I will go back to past tap cap. Um, <laughs> All right. Uh, number one, and you did sort of um, foreshadow this in your earlier comments. Uh, so literally, I would say the number one thing you'll want to know before you start playing XCOM 2 is how to find Sykin's team <laughs> or an XCOM 2 wiki or some source of information. Look, I get it. A lot of people worry about spoilers. Uh, but I got to tell you, man, like this is not a game that that will treat you well if you play it totally blind from start to finish. There's so many things 
that you are denied the most basic information. Like you're leveling up one of your soldiers. It'll ask you to pick between two abilities. Well, the first thing I want to know is how will this ability that I'm choosing, you know, at Sergeant, how will that interact with my future ones? What kind of build am I working towards? Well, you don't know because it's not going to show you any of those later abilities. Mm -hmm. When you're in the research area and you want to know, like, well, if I pick this, what will that do? Well, you're not going to know because the game doesn't tell you. It'll give you this vague description, uh, you know, that's just fluff. And there's so much like that that's in XCOM 2. And listen, screw spoilers. Learn the game. Do what you got to do to learn the game. Um, Syken mentioned Let's Plays. Watching someone who knows what they're doing in a Let's Play, very, very helpful. I know a lot of people don't want to invest that kind of time because it's a long game. I get it. But there's guide videos. There's wikis. You, you have tools at your disposal to, to help accelerate your learning um, because there's just so many things where like when you make your choices on a soldier build or research, that's not easy to unwind in game. And once you fall behind on certain things, you can't realistically catch up. So anyway... Um, my advice is definitely take advantage of the sources of information that are available to you outside the game. I couldn't agree more. I will only add that one uh, aspect to it, which is don't be ashamed to start on Rookie. Um, I think the game did itself a disservice of calling it Rookie. It should simply have called it Soldier or whatever the normal rank is. It is not really a Rookie game on Rookie. And I get it, people that are new to the genre and have played, I don't know, a first-person shooter on the easiest difficulty where you can almost not die at all and then just move the operatives in open field, assuming that in a fair firefight they will just roll over the enemies. That's not what's happening in XCOM. Uh, if you research the wrong material and don't know what you're doing, then the game, even on the easiest difficulty, will make very short progress uh, with you. The one thing that I would add finally to that is maybe even if you know what you're doing and looking up the resources, have a bit of persistency. It is actually surprisingly difficult to lose XCOM 2 uh, if you just continue to, uh, to play it. The game has a lot of catch-up mechanisms. So that's a bonus tip. I agree with that too. Um, you know, XCOM Enemy Unknown, I felt that way about too, mm -hmm. where that's kind of where I, um, I guess, I got acclimated to the whole XCOM, you know, masochistic way of life. Um, but I had campaigns that I was sure I was going to lose and I just kept playing and then I won. And, um, I totally agree that it's so much of it. It all goes back to the mindset. Keep trying, keep pushing forward. So um, with that, I will leave with one little bonus thought. You can call this if you want my sixth thing, but it's very simple. Keep trying new things in XCOM 2 and you'll keep learning new things in XCOM 2. And with that, I'm going to leave it here. Uh, thank you very much, Saiken, for uh, joining me today. Thanks for having me. Also, I want to let people know that we are doing a second video, and this is Saiken's list of five things you should know before starting XCOM 2. I will be joining him on his channel for that video. So please make sure you check that one out as well. That's all for now, though. Thanks for watching. I hope we see you next time.